Welcome everyone. We're just going to wait a few moments for people to come in before we begin. But while we wait, if you want to type in the chat where you're from, we'd love to hear from you. We should let people know that if they want to reach everyone, they need to send their post their chat as to everyone rather than just to hosts and panelists. Yes, so if you if you don't know how to do that, when you go to type right there, right above where it says type your message to the default, yeah, might be hosts and panelists. You click on that to change it to everyone. All right. Well, let's begin. Welcome back everyone to Jane Austen and Company. We are thrilled to see so many people. It looks like from Glasgow to Tokyo join us here tonight for the first event in our 2021 and 2022 series. Asia and the Regency. My name is Anne Ferdig, and I'm a doctoral candidate in English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as the co-director and co-founder of Jane Austen and Company. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, Jane Austen and Company is a free public humanity series hosted by the Jane Austen Summer Program. Our mission is to bring free events and workshops on Jane Austen and her broader global context to audiences around the world. Tonight begins our third virtual series and we couldn't be happier to see you all here tonight. And we're especially happy because tonight we're welcoming Dr. Kunio Ogawa. Tonight she'll be talking on Jane Austen's influence on Japanese realist novels, but we're doubly excited because after this evening, Kimio will be joining us as a co-host for the rest of the series. So if you like Kimio, no worries, you're going to see a lot more of her throughout the next couple of months. You might also recognize a new face up here. We are welcoming our new technical director, Jared Powell. Some of you who attended the Jane Austen Center <coughs> program this past summer might recognize him as the mastermind behind our help desk, and he'll be helping all of you tonight with the chat and Q&A. Before we begin our talk, however, I'm gonna hand things over to my colleague, Dr. Inga Brody, to introduce Kimio and talk a little bit more about what we hope to do with this series. Hi, everyone. Uh, Inga Brody here. I'm an associate professor in the same department as, as Anne and Jared at UNC Chapel Hill, but I also teach in the Asian Studies and Global Studies departments at UNC. I'm the director of the Jane Austen Summer Program, which is the umbrella organization for Jane Austen and Company. Jane Austen and Company began as a library outreach program where we engaged with one or two dozen participants at a time. Um, 
But during COVID, Anne and I decided to take the format online and began with a series staying at home with Jane Austen. It explored the role of various domestic arts in the Regency. Uh, this was followed by our series Race in the Regency, which took interdis interdisciplinary approaches to the experience and representation of race in the Regency, primarily in relation to slavery and abolition. So each event in these two series uh, attracted hundreds of visitors from around the world, several continents, and it was uh, very exciting. So we were happy we made that move despite the circumstances. Um, and we hope to, in general, we hope to lead the way towards creating increasingly international, diverse, and three-dimensional representations of life in the Regency. I like to think of both of these two series we've had as a, a form of unmasking the Regency, uh, both considering um, our, our COVID context and the content. Our speakers are unmasking the far more complex position of international cultural exchange and discourses on race during the period. And it's, and it's also just so nice to see people's faces, literally unmasked in kind of an, an open and cordial conversation. What do we mean by Asia and the Regency? Um, well, we have three things in mind. First of all, um, cultures in Asia uh, that are concurrent with the Regency. So we don't often necessarily, those who study um, English literature don't necessarily think about what's going on uh, in the rest of the world sufficiently. What was going on in Asia while Britain's George III was ill and future George IV hadn't been crowned yet. So just a couple of examples of what's going on in 1811 to 1820 while the Prince Regent is frolicking around in London. Um, in China, this is the Manchu-led Qing Dynasty. In Japan, it's the Edo period uh, ruled by the Tokugawa Shogun a period is largely, influ uh, largely isolated from um, European influence under a strong protectionist law. In South Asia, the waning Mughal empire was struggling against multiple opponents. India itself was under the thrall of British East India Company and experiencing the anglo maratha Wars. Contemporary Myanmar was suffering under the Anglo-Burmese Wars. And what we now call Indonesia was controlled by the Dutch East India Company, except for a few years, interestingly enough, where it was under control of Napoleon I's brother, Louis Bonaparte. The British extended their control to what's now Singapore, establishing it as a crown colony in 1819. So the, the thread here being that British, Dutch, and Spanish imperial activities um, were very invasive in Asia during those few years of the Regency. Um, but Asian influences on the Regency was the second area that, um, that we're interested in here in this series. Um, and as a result of, this is, you know, as you know, as a result of the active British trade in Asia, opium grown in India was sold in China in exchange for Chinese luxury goods like silk and porcelain and tea. These products shaped the British, British and European material culture, um, while the stress caused by Oh, subsequent opium addictions um, wreaked havoc in China and led to the opium wars a few decades later. Britain also imported fine cotton muslins and raw cotton from India. And the, but the influence upon Britain went much further than this. Ideas were imported alongside these goods. Chinese and Japanese languages deeply inspired European and British philosophers of language. Asian art and aesthetics influenced landscape gardening and architecture, for example. And British political philosophers formulated ideals of nationhood and liberty in relation to what they perceived um, of China and other leading countries in Asia. The third area is um, later are the later interactions between Asia and the Regency, including Asian interpretations of the Regency. And that to, uh, today's talk belongs um, to this third category. So it's my honor to introduce Kimio Ogawa. And Dr. Kimio Ogawa is an associate professor in English literature and history of philosophy at Sophia University in Japan in Tokyo. She's published essays on Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary Shelley, Maria Edgeworth, and Jane Austen, among many others. She's also published on Nogami, Nogami Yaeko, female Japanese novelist who helped with the earliest Japanese translation of Austen, helped her husband. 
um, and was a fine novelist in her own right. This essay appears in the forthcoming Palgrave Companion to Jane Austen. She's also co-editor with Mika Suzuki of Johnson's, as in Samuel Johnson in Japan, which just came out in 2021. And she's the co-editor with, with Tristan Connolly of a forthcoming volume called Jane Austen in Asia, which was really what inspired us to, to do this series right now. Kimio writes for and appears frequently in the national news in Japan, and we're so grateful that she made time to participate in this series with us. But before we hear from Kimio, we need just a few words of instruction from uh, Jared. Yes, so let me get these slides up. I've got some slides prepared by my predecessor in this role, Emily Sofera, who you may, some of you may recognize. Uh, <laughs> move that out of the way. Okay, so yes, I'd like to take a moment to explain how tonight's event will work. So it's going to last about 90 minutes in total throughout and after Kimio's presentation, you're welcome to put questions for her in the Q&A box. And so you'll see here on this, these images here on the bottom, you should have something that looks very similar with these different icons, chat, raise hand, Q&A. So questions for Kimio should go into Q&A there on the right. Um, and Inga and Anne will be monitoring that and they will ask them. If you would like to chat to other attendees, you would continue to use the chat box that most of you have been using um, already to tell us where you're zooming in from. And again, that's that circled chat icon there. So questions for Kimio, Q&A, questions for, or just chatting with the audience in chat. And to that end, we usually enjoy quite a robust chat at our events, and some of you may wish to hide the chat if you find it distracting. And so if you wish to do that, that's what this slide here is supposed to show you. So if you were, we recommend popping that chat out into a separate box and pulling it off screen. So if you're on PC here, you click chat, uh, Windows, I think it automatically pops into a pull away box and you can just pull that to the side. Um, if you were on Mac, you have to do an extra step, I believe, and hit in the top right corner of the chat to make it a pop out and then pull it away. But you can also just, if the chat's already out, you can click that and it will fold it in as well if you're on Mac. And if you are on, coming out on mobile here to mute your chat, you click your chat icon there and then click the bell icon in the top. And as you see here, you'll have the option to mute the chat there. So, and if you have uh, difficulty with that, I'll also be looking in the chat for the first little bit and I can help you out. Um, okay, so yeah, that's, that's the technical things. Let me stop share. All right, and I'll turn things back to you, Anne. Thank you, Jared. Please be aware that tonight's program will be recorded. We usually post our recordings to a website within a week after the program, and we'll let you know on our Facebook page and via email when it is available to view. And without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Camille. Thank you, Anne. Um, so, let me share the screen. I hope you can see this. Okay. Okay then. So um, thank you so much for joining today for this talk. Uh, I will be talking about Jane Austen's influence on Japanese realist novels, uh, mainly Natsume Soseki. So here's the outline for today's talk. Uh, firstly, I want to talk about uh, Natsume Soseki, uh, who was influenced by Jane Austen's novels, and also what Sokuten Kyoshi is. Uh, I will go into this later on. Uh, and then moving on to Austen's realism, and, and also Natsume Soseki's reception of Austen's realist novels. And finally, I will talk about uh, Austen's novels uh, themselves and compare them with Soseki's uh, final unfinished novel, Light and Dark. So, 
Natsume Soseki uh, is one of the most widely read uh, novelists in Japan. Uh, even his portrait appeared on Japanese 1000 yen note from 1984 until 2004, uh, as you can see from the slide. He was born in 1867 and uh, lived through the age of modernization. Um, Japan was in the process of modernizing um, during and after Meiji Restoration. That's when uh, Japan uh, lifted its uh, isolationist policy and was opening up to the Western influences. What I need to emphasize uh, is perhaps uh, that he was also a scholar of British literature. He was a visiting scholar in England for two years um, and had dismal experience. Um, he recounts, among English gentlemen, I lived in misery, like a poor dog that had strayed among a pack of wolves. Um, this, however, did not mean that he was not influenced by writers in that tradition. Um, some of his famous novels uh, that you might recognize are Bocha, uh, published in 1906, Kokoro, and, uh, which came out in 1914, and his last uh, novel, Light and Dark, uh, Meya. I Am a Cat, which is his first novel, is a commentary on humankind delivered by a cat. Uh, some say that uh, this novel was inspired by T.A. Hoffman's unfinished novel, The Life of Tom Cat Moore. Uh, Tom Cat Moore is the autobiography of the totally anthropomorphized narrator. So I think he also has a cat narrate a story about this particular teacher. Uh, very, you know, very comic. Um, Soseki's novels are very, very different uh, from those of Zola or Maupassant, uh, which for Soseki was too egotistic uh, or egocentric, um, dominated by the protagonist's or author's point of view. Soseki deplored what he called the grey skies of naturalism, he was critical of naturalist fiction because he thought that intellectual interest and emotional power were absent in this, these novels. He was therefore more geared towards writing about characters' interaction and how that affects their emotional and intellectual dynamism. His novels were largely about uh, the conflict between duty and desire. Uh, uh, this is a very traditional Japanese theme, uh, loyalty and group mentality versus freedom and individuality. You can imagine why he was in, interested in this, because Japan was now opening up to more democratic ideas and also personal isolation and estrangement. So facing the Western influence of thinking about ego or uh, uh, selfhood or independence of a self from a family, uh, that, that makes uh, a character more isolated and estranged. So, so these were the themes that he, he pursued uh, in writing his novels. Um, today's topic is how Austin's novel influenced Soseki's realist novels. Uh, but first of all, I need to introduce Soseki's characteristic approach to literature, uh, which is often called Sokuten Kyoshi. Uh, despite his being one of Japanese literary giants and his great admiration of Austin, there's hardly been a serious study done on Soseki's Sokuten Kyoshi and how Austin's novels helped form this idea. Um, one essay, uh, Jane Austen in Japanese Literature, an overview by uh, Hiroshi Ebine, uh, Miyuki Amano, and uh, Kazuko Hisamori, uh, does mention this word in relation to Austen's novels, uh, but doesn't elaborate in relation to Soseki's interest in realism. Uh, 
Uh, they describe this concept as the literary ideal of Soseki's last years, translating the word sokuten, soku uh, is following, uh, ten is heaven, sokuten, uh, kyoshi, kyo is to eliminate, and shi is self or ego, so forsaking the self. In this way, each Chinese character is endowed with a specific meaning. Uh, being an expert on Chinese poetry as well, Soseki was quite adept at using them. One way of looking at Sokuten Kyoshi is to see it as something unique to, to the last years of Soseki's life, as Ebine and others have explained. It also seems to have some associations with an oriental sense of resignation. Toyoteki tekan might be the kind of Japanese translation of that. Uh, and also Buddhist philosophy based on selflessness or even the bodiless state of self, uh, gazing internally at the tranquility of mind. Uh, my question is, does this Sokuten Kyoshi really mean Buddhist philosophy or bodilessness? Uh, we should not forget that he was studying in Great Britain for two years and was exposed to the influence of modernist ideas and, and the newly emerging science such as physiology and psychology. Add to this, I should say that many readers of Soseki may have dismissed Austin's influence just because of the apparent contrast between Austin's worldliness and Soseki's idea of seemingly Buddhist um, sort of uh, implication of so, uh, Sokuten Kyoshi. Well, as, as far as I know, uh, no one has done uh, research on Austin and Buddhism yet, but uh, Sokuten Kyoshi uh, does not necessarily have to be connected with this kind of philosophy. The element of forgetting or forsaking the, the self uh, does not have to be entirely spiritual. It, it can also be psychological. I would say that Soseki was immersed in a culture of the unconscious and uh, physiology and how modernists saw the psychological phenomenon as both spiritual and corporeal. If you take a look at his essays, such as My Individualism and the Philosophical Foundations of Literature, you can immediately see his infatuation with the internal, that is, uh, physiological plus psychological phenomenon of humans. He read the works of the contemporary psychologists, such as William James's uh, The Principle of Psychology and Henri Poincaré, uh, Science and Method. Um, related to this, I would also like to mention uh, Jung Eto's argument, uh, one of the most formidable Japanese literary critics. Uh, he's long been skeptical of the idea of spiritual soseki, saying that it was largely formed and reinforced by his disciple. Eto criticizes this, this as a, a myth of Sokuten Kyoshi. According to him, uh, one very enthusiastic follower of soseki, uh, Toyotaka Komiya, uh, equates um, Sokuten Kyoshi with Soseki's unique state of mind, which he was able to achieve after his serious ill health uh, in the spa town of Shuzenji. This is the picture of Shuzenji. Uh, in June 1910, as Soseki was finishing his ma masterpiece, uh, The Gate or Mon in Japanese, he began to suffer from serious stomach problems. To recuperate, he traveled to Shuzenji, uh, but, this, uh, but his health deteriorated. He suffered a massive near fatal stomach hemorrhage, causing him to vomit over a half kilo of blood uh, 
um, Eto criticizes the myth that Sosegi's mind was sublimated to a state of tranquility after this incident. Eto argues that um, through such a process of myth creation by Komiya and other disciples, the idea of Sokuten Kyoshi contributed to Soseki's image of having sort of like a um, saint, saint-like aloofness. Rejecting this idea that Soseki's ill health uh, contributed to this miraculous state of mind, Eto defines Sokuten Kyoshi as a newly developed literary style that resembles realism. Therefore, Eto states that Soseki's persistence in this idea does not prove that this saint-like condition enabled him to transcend his bodily concerns or the palpable reality. On the contrary, I, I would like to say, uh, following Eto's argument, Sokuten Kyoshi represents Soseki's shift towards uh, more of an Austin-like creative uh, experiment. Uh, Kyoshi, uh, forsaking the self of, of Sokuten Kyoshi, did not just mean uh, forgetting or leaving the subjective position of the self. Um, Soseki admired Austin's work enormously, um, and I want to explain why today. So um, his remark of Austin's literary style is in fact accompanied with um, his detailed analysis of Austin's work, uh, one of which is Sense and Sensibility. In uh, his book, Fear of Literature, um, you can actually read it in English because it's translated. Um, so in, in this book, A Theory of Literature, he refers to a unique condition of Marianne, whose half-consciousness ramblings in her feverish state. If you've read Sense and Sensibility, I'm sure you remember the scene where Marianne um, uh, is heartbroken because Willoughby, who she thought would, you know, was in love with her, uh, decided to marry somebody else. Uh, she thought that she was in a romantic relationship uh, leading to marriage, but um, uh, well, that was, um, you know, so she had to face a very disappointing um, uh, consequence. Um, now, she, she faces reality that um, he's leaving her and she's on the verge of death uh, in ill condition. Uh, so I think she was so uh, depressed that she she walks in the rain, and so I think she she catches a uh, very bad cold. Um, so she's she's in, she's suffering from fever. Although from one perspective, her behavior of crying out. So it, this is in, during her feverish state. She cries out. She her mother must not go around by London. I mean, so she's not really conscious. She's half conscious. Um, her mother must not go around by London. This, this, this phrase seems quite senseless uh, or even mad. However, it can also be looked at from the visionary point of view of the poet, uh, says Soseki. So Soseki is very intrigued by the fact that uh, Marianne's half consciousness or half unconsciousness makes us say something quite um, perceptive. Um, so this is, this is Soseki pointing out Marianne's um, um, kind of ingenious remark about her mother needing to uh, come to London um, and not, not detour. So he says, Marianne's half unconscious state is, it's, it's a sign that she has taken leave of her normal self. He states, in the state of having taken leave of one's everyday self, the life force in the spirit can be dispatched a thousand miles into the distance and can know the past and future things that cannot be sensed with the eyes and ears. So I think he was very much interested in the, the kind of dis um, disparity between what one can see physically and what one knows unconsciously. So this is very much 
you know, a modernist kind of idea. In describing Marianne's condition, he almost says, but does not quite say that this is a condition of Sokuten Kyoshi. Uh, although Sosuke admits that Austin is a realist writer, he says that Marianne's blurting out in an unusual psychological condition illustrates her occult propensities or um, this, this occult phenomenon, uh, which is unexplainable in normal terms. So he's constantly aware of a normal self and not normal self or unconscious self. Uh, here we must pause to observe the contradiction, I think. Marion's example, which Sosuke refers to, does point to something occult, uh, or at least something that transcends selfhood. And it can be seen as an exemplar case of forsaking self. Kyoshi. What I would like to suggest today is that by Sokuten Kyoshi, Soseki means it is a philosophical concept, therefore does not wholly contradict with Komiya's approach or possibly, you know, Buddhist philosophy or kind of saint-like aloofness is there. At the same time, it, it is also a literary technique as Ito has maintained. This idea of forsaking self, I believe, does not necessarily mean being in a state of selfless objectivity. I argue that um, Soseki, while using the term kyoshi, he never meant to forsake the subjective position of the self. Uh, as I will later show, he was constantly thinking of the impact that both objective and subjective positions have on one's perception of things, or what he calls awareness. So he uses this term awareness many, many times. Rather than simply relying on Soseki's anecdotal tale of his great illness, which Komiya says enabled him to have a fixed superhuman viewpoint, uh, we could reassess Soseki's Sokuten Kyoshi as his literary, psychological, and also philosophical experiment, which was similar to Austin's attempt to write a new kind of novel. Um, one of the interesting research findings that points to this direction is shown by Kathleen Flynn and Josh Katz. Um, using a technique called principal components analysis, Flynn and Katz worked on a two-dimensional chart based on the vocabulary uh, in each book. Austin's novels are placed in this chart along with 125 of the British works uh, of narrative fiction published between 1710 and 1920. Uh, this finding sh suggests that her novels tend to have a vocabulary that focuses on acute emotional intelligence and a rare ability to render it in stories. Um, as you can see in this chart, uh, particularly the top left-hand side of this chart, you can see uh, that Austin is uh, nearly alone. Uh, according to Flynn, Flynn and Katz, this is related to a higher than ever average propensity to use words related to time markers, such as always, fortnight or week. And she also tends to use words that express the states of mind, um, such as awkward, um, decided, dislike, glad, sorry, suppose. Um, Austin, according to them, was heavy a heavy user of words like could in her novels, often combined with not, and tends to be found with words or phrases connected to thinking, perceiving, and talking, thus suggesting that the herons have emotional intelligence. At, at the heart of uh, Austin's work is the perception uh, of the characters uh, that attempts to pierce the veneer of, or, or perhaps the shallow surface, that polite world of Jane Austen demands, which resembles the features of modernist writing. So, uh, for example, Elizabeth is always trying to find out the truth about the 
other people. So the reason why she is um, deceived or she is deluded to thinking that Wickham is a good man or Darcy is uh, that's too proud, you know. So she she is actually kind of trying to um, she is attempting at guessing uh, what kind of truthful. Uh, selfhood there is inside, you know, or the beyond the veneer of, of, uh, of other people's personality. Okay, sorry. So that's finished. Um, let me introduce this quote from the renowned Austin scholar, uh, John Milland. This, I think, supports uh, Flynn and Kat's argument that Austin's novels were ahead of the time, um, that her novels were very experimental and one of a kind among the contemporary literature, as you saw in the chart. He was characterized, he has, he has characterized Austin's novels, particularly Emma, uh, as being experimental. Uh, it is so experimental that it anticipates the narrative of some modernist novels like those of Virginia Woolf and Proust. He states, the narrative was radically experimental because it was designed to share her delusions. The novel bent narration through the distorting lens of its protagonist's mind. Though little noticed by most of the pioneers of fiction for the next century and more, it belongs with the great experimental novels of Flaubert or Joyce or Wolf. Wolf wrote that if Austin had lived longer and written more, she would have been the forerunner of Henry James and of Proust. Wolf is, is probably seeing what Sosaki was seen in Austin's work. Uh, Henry James's brother, as, as we know, was indeed William James, who prim whose primary interest was the depth of psychology, and, and they share the similar interest in the mind. Virginia Woolf praised Austen's work in this way. Of all great writers, she is the most difficult to catch in the act of greatness. Uh, this seems to have a lot in common with what Soseki does in his novel. Um, Soseki contemplated on the kind of role uh, that the human mind, conscious and unconscious, plays when his fictional characters take certain actions or fail to do so. More precisely, I argue that uh, Soseki's interest in the brain should be considered in relation to how Austin's work influenced him. Uh, due to time constriction, I can only focus on his last novel, Light and Dark, and how Austin's approach uh, to the human mind influenced his literary style. I will not go into much detail about Austin and neuroscience, uh, since Alan Richardson has already investigated this theme in his Neurosublime uh, Cognitive Theories and Romantic Text, if you're interested. Uh, it's a brilliant book. Now I will move on to discussing uh, Sosaki's fascination with scientific psych psychology of his time, such as Poincaré and uh, William James, and will show that all of these were very much interconnected. Uh, as I showed earlier, um, if she, uh, which means self or the ego of Sokuten Kyoshi is one of the most important philosophical ideas of Sosaki, what did it actually mean for him? Um, in his essay, The Philosophical Foundations of Literature, uh, Sosaki um, discusses the way in which the world is comprised of reciprocal reactions between the ego and the outside. Through reading his essay, we, we learn that he tries to define self in terms of one standpoint, since Sosaki further emphasizes the importance of distance as something that enables one to perceive the true self. If he is implying Sokuten Kyoshi in grasping self in terms of distance and not just forsaking or forgetting, Kyoshi you know, does not mean a total annihilation, annihilation of self, but how one positions oneself from the awareness, uh, or maybe modernists would call it unconscious. Um, 
For example, he states that defining the ego or I in terms of bodily presence with physical features such as coat or stiff collar is eminently uh, suspect. So uh, this is a quotation uh, from uh, the uh, philosophical um, foundation of literature. It is clear that this coat and this stiff collar can be touched, but they are not I. If I were asked whether this body whose hand or foot I scratch when it itches or when I stroke, when it hurts, is really I, well, I would respond that no, it is no one. What we call itching or pain are the sensations. Scratching or stroking oneself is a response to a psychological desire. According to Soseki, this realization is achieved when we stand back a little and distance ourselves from an incidental way of thinking. He then goes on to defining I, not so much a palpable body as the phenomenon of being aware of oneself. Uh, Soseki uses this word awareness frequently in light and dark as well. So maybe it is true that he was obsessed with Sokuten Kyoshi in the last stage of his life. But at the same time, the dual meaning that Soseki attaches to self has to be remembered. Um, he presupposes that the self in a common usage cannot explain what he attempted to define as true self. While Soseki's terminology seems to belong to an entirely separate tradition or a historical context, it seems to express the same kind of conscious subconscious levels, which Austin frequently shows in her novels. Her Pride and Prejudice, for example, is a goldmine of these examples. Uh, what captured Soseki's attention in her novels may have been her ingenuity in describing how one's awareness subconsciously continues to exist as a coherent whole underneath, underneath his or her consciousness. For example, uh, Elizabeth Bennett, who is initially charmed by the countenance, voice and manner of Mr. Wickham comes to see that for a very long time, she was aware uh, of his vices, although it never surfaces or catches her attention until she learns of his past selfish and ill-intentioned conduct from Mr. Darcy. So this is a quotation from Pride and Prejudice. She tried to recollect some instance of goodness, some distinguished trait of integrity or benevolence in Mr. Wickham that might rescue him from the attacks of Mr. Darcy, but no such recollection befriended her. She could see him instantly before her, in every charm of air and address, but she could remember no more substantial good than the general approbation of the neighborhood and the regard which his social powers had gained him in the mess. Um, now that she hears about Mr. Wickham's extravagance and general profligacy, which is the driving force of this particular character, all the memories she has stored up in her mind are pieced together as one, pointing to something that is now quite solid and reliable. Austin's fascination with the workings of the human mind is expressed through the following sentence, which describes Elizabeth's thought about the first conversation she had with Mr. Wickham. She was now struck with the impropriety of such communications to a stranger and wondered why it had escaped her before. So Austin is interrogating the condition of the brain, which deluded itself by making Elizabeth wonder why she never saw Mr. Wickham's approach as improper. All the while she had held on to something truth, truthful deep in the psyche, but wasn't aware of it all the time. Um, but at the, e at the end, um, she, she, does, she does realize that it was always there and gives rise to her sense of rightfulness. 
In direct contrast to Elizabeth's impression of Mr. Wickham, her judgment of Mr. Darcy was uh, due, due to this, uh, due to his uh, exterior appearance of pride and his failure to be behave in a gentlemanlike manner. Uh, she says to Mr. Darcy uh, when she proposed, when she is proposed to for the first time, from the very beginning, from the first moment, I may almost say, of my acquaintance with you, your manners impressing me with the fullest belief of your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain of the feelings of others were such as to form that groundwork of disapprobation on which succeeding events have built so immovable a dislike. And I had known you a month before I felt that you were the last man in the world whom I, I could ever be prevailed on to marry. So the first time she was proposed to, she, she rejects his, his marriage proposal. Um, she does, however, continue to observe Mr. Darcy, who transpires to be much more good-natured and generous-hearted than she initially thought. This is symbolically portrayed by his miniature painting, Home, in his father's room. Uh, together with the witness account of the housekeeper at Pemberley, uh, Mr. Darcy's, uh, this is Mr. Mr. Darcy's residence, the housekeeper who served him since he was four says that handsome portrait of Mr. Darcy is very like him. And that is when Elizabeth's keenest attention was awakened. This awakening enables her to perceive his true nature. Austin's narrative technique seems to highlight two things. One is that there is a subterranean awareness, though mostly unchecked by her consciousness, which continues undetected for a very long time. And the other is that the truth about a person is concentrated on a pictorial image uh, that is shown to the uh, perceiver. This may well explain why Soseki, in his essay, insisted on making two categories of awareness in thinking about self. One is the continuity of awareness, a linear progression, which is typically seen in literary narratives. And, and the other is the content of awareness itself, which is manifest in a painting or a pictorial form of expression. The ideal that proceeds from the former awareness is revealed via a process of modification of, of awareness. So Elizabeth's modification of her awareness fits this category of Soseki. Soseki uses the term sui, uh, sui is, a, a, is a change or modification to express this process. He, he states that throughout this change, there uh, exists a certain correspondence between one's awareness and another's. He calls the encroachment of these two separate realms uh, correspondence because subconsciously, without any articulation, two people of different bodies can correspond with each other subconsciously. And this is applicable to the relationship uh, between the author novel and the reader. Uh, please look at this um, quotation. Um, if we penetrate, this is Soseki saying, if we penetrate into these regions, having already detach, detached one's, uh, ourselves from the situation of the common people, we transcend the framework within which the ego and uh, other beings or objects are situated. Now, transcending this limit between the ego and external beings or objects is the starting point of my lecture and constitutes the fundamental origin of all this speculation. As a result, while we continue to benefit subconsciously from artistic and literary works and forgetting our ego and forgetting that of the artist or the writer, this implies a process that is not directed towards introspection. There is neither time nor space, but only continuity of awareness. As we can see, uh, Soseki's interest lies more in the relationship between the ego and other beings than the absence of the ego, kyoshi. Um, therefore, I therefore argue, or I want to say, that Soseki focuses on the artistic or literary works and how they penetrate 
the awareness of a character. This may be ap applied to Elizabeth's penetration of truth depicted in Mr. Darcy's miniature portrait. Uh, Mr. Darcy's internal truth encapsulated in the form of picture is penetrated by the heroine and she, she sees goodness, which is untouched by all the delusional uh, deceptive language fed by Mr. Um, Wickham. Therefore, a pictorial form for both Austen and Sosek had a profound meaning in representing one's awareness hidden away, uh, tucked away from one's eyes uh, or, or ears. Sosek singled out Austen as the leading authority uh, in the world of realism, but we must understand that he did not necessarily regard her realism as that of the external uh, material world, uh, because senses, including vision, sound, touch, uh, and smell, taste, uh, could be delusional. Um, Soseki, in particular, valued that um, valued something that goes beyond these five senses. So this is again another quote from Soseki. But we, we do not know in relation to that question, to what extent the senses complicate matters. The things that we cannot see today with the naked eye that we cannot touch with our hands or even those things that go beyond the five senses are progressively, I think, entering into our fields of awareness. And so it seems to me the best thing for us is to take our time and wait. Um, although, Sokuten Kyoshi is a difficult concept to digest. The comprehensive definition may be the ability or inability to penetrate into the psychological changes that take place in the depth of another person. This is typically observed in Elizabeth's inability and later ability to perceive the internal awareness of Mr. Darcy or Mr. Wickham. Uh, she's for example, shocked later on at hearing about Mr. Wickham's elopement with her sister Lydia. Uh, this illustrates that she was completely oblivious to his thoughts. There, there's a great episode which Soseki recounts in his essay called The Behavior of the Creative Writer. Uh, this story interestingly shows the same phenomenon of the mind that fails to perceive the internal awareness um, Soseki tells a story about a man who is having an affair with Geisha. Geisha is a beautiful woman. Um, uh, in Japan, we, we, I'm sure you know Geisha. Um, so when, when these two people get on a boat uh, for leisure, he spots a shrine in a distance. He decides to go there and climb many steps to reach the, the shrine. Geisha is actually looking uh, at his back and comes upon a sudden realization that she no longer loves him. Soseki was fascinated by this story, this, this psychological condition where something internal hidden deep beneath the conscious rises to the surface. What seems to be a sudden realization, however, is in fact a slow process of modification, which takes place apart from the conscious part of the brain. So we can easily locate this scientific source, sources of such an inspiration for Soseki, uh, as I mentioned earlier. The complexity of human mind is elaborated by Henri uh, Poincaré, a contemporary psychologist whose work Soseki even mentions in his novel, Light and Dark. Poincaré uh, states in his book, Science and Method, only those things which are interesting find their way into the field of consciousness. Um, according to him, it is certain that the combinations which present themselves to the mind in a kind of sudden illumination after a somewhat prolonged period of unconscious work are generally uh, useful and fruitful combinations. In other words, these combinations stay undetected for an extended period of time but once aroused, he says, uh, they will direct our attention upon them and will thus give them the opportunity of becoming conscious. 
in his essay, The Behavior of the Creative Writer, Soseki explains that many instances resembling the phenomenon of, of the mind uh, presented by Geisha can be observed in William James's book, uh, The Principle of Psychology. Uh, here, uh, James emphasizes the complexity of the brain function, stating that bodily experiences and more particularly brain experiences um, must take a place amongst those conditions of the mental life of which uh, psychology need to take account. Uh, thus, for him, the very self or ego of the individual comes to be viewed no longer as the pre-existing source of the representation, such as simply the soul, uh, but rather as their last and most complicated fruit. Soseki does, uh, does not analyze Austin's Emma, unfortunately, uh, but this novel exemplifies this very complexity of brain experiences. The narration, for example, follows the path of the heroine's errors all, all along. Um, the novel's innovative approach uh, is to allow this narrative path to explore not just Emma's feelings, but also her ignorance of her unconscious feelings. Uh, if we were to borrow John Mullen's words, uh, Austin's technique resembles that of modernist novels because it was designed to share her delusions. It's sort of like McEwan's Atonement, if you if you read it. Um, Emma persuades uh, Harriet, uninstructed young woman, to refuse a marriage proposal from a farmer who loves her to match her up with a young vicar, Mr. Elton. After Harriet is scorned by Mr. Elton, Emma is convinced that she can be paired with the eligible, eligible uh, Frank Churchill. Only when Harriet confesses that she is in love with Mr. Knightley, uh, Emma finally realizes that she herself was in love with Mr. Knightley, uh, that her unconscious feelings never caught her attention and were not given the opportunity of becoming conscious. Uh, Austin's brilliance is that she gives weight to the following sentence uh, to signify um, this mysterious workings of the brain. Um, uh, this is the, the quote from Emma. It darted through her with the speed of an arrow that Mr. Knightley must marry no one but herself. So Austin shows us that love can be a discovery of what a person has unknowingly felt for many years. Considering how she used Mr. Darcy's portrait as a signifier of truth, in Emma, she's deploying the same method ironically. In this novel, uh, the picture which Emma draws of Harriet becomes an artifact uh, that does not mirror the truth. Um, Worse still, Austin represents Emma's depiction of Harriet as falsifying, as she states, uh, Emma meant to throw in a little improvement to the figure to give a little more height and considerably more elegance. So when, when Emma is drawing um, uh, Harriet's portrait, you know, she sort of tries to beautify her so, so that uh, Mr. Elton uh, would fall in love with her. So with a touch of irony, Austin demonstrates that the kind of portrait that embodies truth is actually engraved on one's heart and not on the canvas. Uh, based on her wrong judgment, Emma fails to take the right conduct throughout from the be beginning to the end. However, in chapter 49, Austin reveals that Emma's awareness, though unconscious, was not mistaken. As the narrator says, seldom, very seldom, does complete truth belong to any human disclosure. Seldom can it happen that something is not a little disguised or a little mistaken, but where, as in this case, though the conduct is mistaken, the feelings are not, it may be a very, um, it may not be very material. So the lesson here is that um, if one's feelings have stayed the same, underneath the conscious, the consequence is insignificant. 
in a sense, the problem which are faced by Soseki is protagonists in light and dark are irresolvable precisely because the feelings of Tsuda and Onobu, um, his married couple, have erred from the beginning. Light and Dark, uh, Mea in Japanese, was first published um, in daily serialized installments in Tokyo and Osaka editions of the Asahi newspaper beginning on May 16, uh, 1916. As his illness deteriorated, the writing of the novel became increasingly problematic. In the end, he had he became too ill to continue and uh, he died leaving this novel unfinished. Um, this is a story of Onobu who falls in love with a man called Tsuda and marries, but eventually finds out that there is something that he hides from her. In fact, he cannot forget his past lover, Kyoko. In the meantime, Tsuda goes to a hospital to have a minor operation. Mrs. Yoshikawa, the wife of Tsuda's boss, is a meddler who has a major part to play in complicating the conjugal relationship between Tsuda and Onobu, all because she also had a role to play in Tsuda's earlier love relationship with Kyoko. Uh, there's a dramatic sequence at the hospital where Tsuda is recuperating from the operation. Um, you know, he has arguments with his sister uh, Hideko and uh, Hideko also has an argument with uh, Onobu over, over these kind of relationship. Um, later on, finding out that Kyoko is staying in a certain spa town, Mrs. Yoshika suggests to um, uh, Tsuda that he should make a trip uh, to meet her and uh, to inquire of the reason why they had to separate. Indeed, this, this setting is perfect for the kind of story that Soseki would experiment on if his intention was to illustrate the phenomenon of the human mind uh, or Sokuten Kyoshi. Onobu's situation very much reminds us of geisha story in which suddenly an idea that her lover is selfish darts through, through her. Uh, if Halfway through the novel, Onobu finds herself thinking about Tsuda as a self-centered man. Uh, the narrator explains, despite the fact that she extended to him from morning to night what she, intent, what, what she intended to be the fullest extent of kindness and consideration she was capable of. Was there no limit to the sacrifice her husband required? So, so this, is, this is the voice coming out of um, Onobu. A few chapters before, uh, there is an incident uh, that foreshadows this sudden realization. Although Onobu is as self-deluded as Austin's heroines, uh, although Onobu's intention is simply to look nice as she is accompanying Tsuda to the hospital, uh, when he sees her dressed up, he responds rather unkindly. He says to her, it feels as if Waltzing into the clinic as a couple with you in that getup would be a little. And when Onobu asks him excessive, he starts to laugh aloud. Here, Soseki does not describe Onobu's awareness, but simply hints at her annoyance uh, for her eyebrows briefly arched. Uh, there are many more hints that underneath her conscious mind, her unconscious does know that Tsuda is a self-centered man. After realizing this, the narrator explains that Onobu's first impression was wrong and admits that Onobu had misjudged the man. The reader learns that in the little more than half a year that had passed since her marriage, Onobu's thoughts about Tsuda had changed. What is most relevant here may be the distance that Onobu takes from her own mind um, or what goes on in her thoughts. The, the following passage uh, reverberates with Austin's description of Elizabeth's or, or Emma's mind. Neither is in control of their brain and the heron just simply waits to be acted upon by its operation. This is the, the quotation. An image of Tsuda in those days flickered in Onobu's mind. He was the same person as now, and yet he wasn't. 
Speaking plainly, the same Tsuda had changed. The man who had appeared indifferent in the beginning had gradually been drawn closer to her. The doubt nearly constituted her reality. The seemingly accurate description of what Onobu's mind is doing presents its peculiar reality. And this seems very much like Austin's realism. Another instance where Soseki has his character penetrates the internal awareness of other character is when Tsuda encounters Kiyoko at the inn in the, the hot spring village. When he, he looks at Kiyoko, her body stiffens, the muscles in her face also tensed. Here's the quotation from the novel. Even as the thought of Tsuda passed, the very person he had supposed it might be appeared above him ineluctably, in the grip of surprise, 10 times more powerful than a minute ago, he stopped, rooted to the spot, not even his eyes moved. A similar emotion seemed to have assaulted Kyoko when even more virulence, with even more virulence, as she reached the wooden floor and halted there, she became for Tsuda a kind of painting. The impression he received would remain engraved on his heart. He attains the truth about Kyoko's feelings because she was caught by surprise. This is the tragic moment for Tsuda since she became a kind of painting which presents the truth about her awareness that she disliked him all along. When Tsuda confronts uh, Kyoko the next day, she is more composed and is ready to evade any question questions posed. Even when he says to her, I'm wondering, since you were shocked last night, how you're able to be so composed this morning? I ask because I don't understand what's going on psychologically. This is what he says. Here, we clearly see a case of Sokuten Kyoshi in that Soseki through the mouthpiece of Tsuda is reaching out to the internal awareness of Kyoko, although he or they failed to do so. Even if this novel, Light and Dark, is an unfinished novel, the extent to which the author was challenging, not just in terms of literary technique, but also psychologically and philosophically, I would say, very much owes to the depth of Austen's literature. Uh, the key to unveiling Soseki's myth of Sokuten Kyoshi, I would say, is, uh, is to redefine uh, not his idea of self, but that of awareness which is essentially multi-layered for a Soseki. When this awareness is concentrated in the pictorial form, like we saw in Jane Austen's novels and also in Light and Dark, um, we know that we, he was able to successfully apply Austen's literary technique to portray something that cannot be grasped with these five senses. So um, that's the end of my lecture. Uh, thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you very much. Can I you... hope I'm doing okay with time. You're fine, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're gonna open up now to um, general questions from everyone. And um, so please post your questions in the Q&A box. And we'll, um, Anne and I will read them to, um, or pose them to, to Camille. Um, while we're waiting for a few more people to post, um, can, Camille, some of our audience did read the opening of Mayan. Um, uh -huh. And uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, because on a first reading, they don't seem, it doesn't seem very Austin-like at all. <laughs> um, so I yeah. wonder if you could give more of, um, let people make the connection a little bit more with with Austin from the that that sample of the very opening. Uh, which which scene are you talking about? Because um, opening scene of Mayan or opening yes, scene Mayan. of Mayan. That's what we, we gave them a copy of um, the op opening uh, <laughs> the beginning yeah. of Mayan. Okay. Well, I mean, I think I think the striking thing about Mayan is that there is this uh, character. Mrs. Yoshikawa, and she's always there. She's uh, even from the beginning. She's she's there as a major influence uh, on Suda uh, and Onobu, 
and she's a meddler. And I think the meddler is a very Austin like character, don't you think? I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, there's always these meddlers. I mean, you know, Sense and Sensibility has a meddler. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they're always, there's all, they're always trying to control the situation, especially in relation to um, uh, marriage plot. You know, um, I think they are much more present than Austin or Soseki. They are actually, you know, she, they are foregrounded as being the controller of these, the, you know, the fate of these couple uh, and, and confuses everything. <laughs> what, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, the opening scene is really very much about, you know, Tsuda talking to Yoshikawa, you know, Fujin, and um, she, she, she's a great character, I think. <laughs> To me, it it seemed a lot like persuasion in tone, this Uh idea of regret and what was lost Uh and left behind. Um, I don't know, that just throwing my two cents in. As somebody who is coming to it for the first time, I I felt that same kind of sense of melancholy that you kind of get at the beginning of of persuasion. Hmm. So Anne, are you talking about Anne's kind of regret of Captain Wetworth leaving her? And um, yeah, but but I mean, um, it's interesting because I, I didn't really see, you know, see that part of, you know, uh, fr- from also Seki's novels. But I, I, I think in Mong and um, other other very interesting novels written by Soseki has similar theme of regret almost all the time you know the couple marrying somebody who they may not you know uh, think they are the, the the right person you know and and I think Anne Elliot always think that you know she should have married she should have married Captain Wentworth then not you know not you know now she's kind of regretting that she didn't take action um I think the opposite thing happens, even if the theme is there. I think Sosek is always talking about, you know, in his novels, he's always trying to express the kind of regret that the the main character has chosen this person because it was fate. It, he, he, he had this passion and it was uncontrollable. Uh, he did get married, but uh, the consequence was quite tragic. Um, the, the fact that she, for example, the, the, the protagonist of Mong marries this woman uh, because he fell in love with her. But afterwards, because he, she, he actually literally um, took her away from his best friend. You know, so he, his regret is, oh, I ruined my friendship with Yasui. You know, so Sosuke is the protagonist. But, but that, that kind of regret is everywhere. You can find that kind of regret everywhere in, in Soseki's novels, I think, yeah. Okay, we've got lots of fun questions here. Um, okay. We're gonna just jump around if you don't mind, the different topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> what, why was Soseki's picture removed from the currency? One of our viewers asks. Was, oh, when, was there any when? kind of, no, what, well, uh, why? why? Was oh, there a scandal okay. like there was with Andrew oh, no. <laughs> here? I mean, I, sh- I should have brought the, the current um, 1,000. Can I just go and get it? It's just sure, there. Sure. <laughs> he was for, so for eight or 10 years, Soseki was the most widely circulated face in Japan. Oh, yes. Uh, now I'm going to show you this. So this is the, the, the current note. And it doesn't have a soseki on it. It's uh, Noguchi Hideo, a scientist. Um, I think I don't think there is particular reason why it was changed to, to this uh, person. Uh, they they frequently change. Uh, I, I have no idea. Um, I wish I wish we had soseki on our banknote now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Someone says he looks like Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, if, if, Anne, do you want to ask a question? Or? Yeah. We had a, uh, you said at the beginning of your talk that Soseki was critical of naturalist works. And we have some mm. audience members wondering if you could define naturalism in this mm. context. Okay. Well, um, 
so it's very difficult, I think, to understand what Soseki thought about naturalism. From my point of view, naturalism is really uh, uh, more about describing the character uh, uh, in detail, you know, the minute detail. And so external uh, uh, presentation of each character uh, uh, is more focused rather than the internal kind of contemplation. Um, so at the time, Zola Mopasso was a major influence on Japanese literature. And uh, there were people like Futaba Teishime and um, Ozaki Koyo. And these two people were more like uh, naturalists, you know, more, more real, realist, you know, they wrote realist novels based on the idea that naturalism would um, get them closer to realism. So uh, these two other writers, o Ozaki Koyo and Futaba I think they, they don't really, they weren't that much concerned about, you know, how the internal psychology of each character worked. Uh, whereas Soseki was fascinated by, you know, uh, Austin's realism, which was much more internal than external. Um, I don't know so much about Zola or Monpasson and their reception in Japan, uh, because I'm not a specialist in this area, but um, as a kind of... Um, general reader of Ozaki uh, Koyo and uh, Futaba Tishime, I can see a striking difference between these ty two types of realisms. Uh, but I much prefer uh, Soseki's type of realism, and that's why I chose to talk about um, realist novels in Japan uh, in relation to Soseki's novel. So for Austin readers um, who are new to Soseki, which novel would you recommend they're starting with? Uh, amongst Austin's or? No, no, Soseki. Soseki. Uh, I, I mentioned I am a, I'm a cat at the beginning of my talk uh, because I thought it was um, much more readable than Mayan, for example. Um, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting way of um, portraying a character from outside. So um, I think I think Soseki wasn't so much interested in this thing called awareness in the at the beginning of his career. So I think he was just mocking, you know, uh, by using um, cat a cat as a narrator and showing the comical side of uh, humans, you know, satirizing the stupidity of a teacher, you know, <laughs> and it's it's all, you know, it really makes you laugh. So I think if you want to get used to his um, uh, narrative, you know, uh, I think I'm a cat is is a is is a starting point, I think. But my my favorite is, uh, as I keep saying, you know, is the gate. Mon is so because my my favorite's persuasion, and maybe I have you know <laughs> there's some some something in common here. You know, my favorite among Austin uh, novels is, has been persuasion because it is about regret, and and I think Soseki is um is also some I, I don't know what he you know what kind of life he had uh, to make him write something so depressing but um i love depressing <laughs> stories <laughs> like, you know austin toward the end of it, her life you know she was writing about anne ellen who was always regretting you know of the past and i i think you know uh, soseki towards the end of his life was very much into these kind of regrets. And, but at the same time, they're both not very much, you know, so, so pessimistic. They, they, they did actually see hope, I think, because they, they understood what failure meant, you know, that you can always start anew, right? So that, that's also similar. Um, but, um, but I think Sanshiro is also a very interesting novel to read because if, if you want to know the mentality of a young boy living in Meiji and Taisho period, uh, that's exactly how they must have felt. You know, uh, they were taught in a very traditional way from when they were young, but when the Western literature and philosophy came in, 
you know, boys get confused. You know, what am I to believe? You know, I've been taught to, to obey and, you know, be sub, you know, um, submissive to the authority. But now you are given this freedom to think on your own. How, you know, so, so that kind of confusion, um, I can very much understand as, yeah, as I was kind of um, experiencing my Western, <laughs> uh, experiencing my, my, um, my version of Western, Western education, and I was kind of going through the same kind of confusion. So looking at the West from Asian point of view, I think Sanshiro is a fascinating novel. My students like Sanshiro and Kokoro very much. Both. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that sort, um, of con sort of co conflict, I'm, I'm sure people must have felt at least once in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I just want to take a note that we're going to be sending out a list of some translations of Soseki around tomorrow. So if you're interested in any of these books, watch your emails because um, we're going to send you some that you can find in English. And speaking of translations, we had suggested a John Nathan's translation of Light and Dark as our excerpt. And mm. uh, one reader noted that in his introduction, he mentions Austin's influence, but suggests that Henry James was a stronger influence. Mm. Um, and do you have an opinion on this, how they might dif differ in their representation of the unconscious or how they might um, have influenced Sosaki different differently? Yeah, you see, I can't really draw a clear line between how much of the modernist idea came from Henry James or William James, because they, <laughs> um, uh, actually, there, there's a really book, good book. Um, I can't find it now, but um, uh, recently oh. there was, a, it's a Japanese book, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a really good book about Soseki novels and how he was influenced by William James, not Henry James, but um, uh, it's a very solid research. Um, if anybody who can read Japanese, uh, it, the title is Hua Hua <laughs> The title is a little kind of comical, but Hua Hua Suru Soseki. If you can read Japanese, you should get hold of it because uh, it doesn't talk about Henry James, but it does talk about this idea that the, uh, the unconscious was very much uh, in the air when when uh, Soseki uh, studied in Great Britain and he, he he was massively influenced by William James and I I was only starting to look into this when I bought the book and read it um, but um, Henry James I think has the sa same uh, narrative technique. It's just that Austin was only beginning, I think. So if she had developed, if she lived long enough, I'm sure she must have written something very similar to Henry James. So I can't really tell. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, so someone here is asking whether um, the self-awareness was an unusual subject or a, a fairly common subject in Japanese literature at the time Soseki was writing. Can you, can you say the first word? How, how common was self-awareness as a topic oh. in literature, in Jap Japanese literature? Um, because when he was writing, I think she shows it was um, um, the, the, probably the most popular form or genre of novels written in Japanese at the time. She shows it is I novel. So uh, it, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to tell whether the author is the I or whether the narrator is the I. They mix them up. And, um, but that's the attraction of I novel or as it's um, So I think, I think what um, um, Soseki is doing is that this self-awareness, <laughs> which was um, in the vogue at the time, he wanted, I think he wanted to distance himself from this self-awareness and making it awareness, <laughs> more like detached from the self. Um, so I don't know. Um, may maybe, maybe, maybe he, he was trying to go against the, the mainstream of, of the, the, the Japanese contemporary writers, perhaps. I think we have time for one more question. 
Um, this one is about man. Uh, the relationship there seems more troubled than the relationships you compared in Austin. Uh, would you say that's so? Would you say that Tosecki's relationships are more troubled? And what do you think that signifies as a response to Austin or to the modernism Tosecki was responding to? So relationship between characters, you mean? Yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. Um, I think, I think, well, Jane, Jane Austen's plot uh, centers around a uh, relationship uh, of two uh, characters, mainly two characters or sometimes four characters. Um, and I think, of course, Sosiki didn't just read Austen. He read George Eliot, he read Bronte, Meredith, and all the other you know, 19th century novels. Um, so I think he doesn't just get this from Austen, but I think this kind of troubled relationship or complicated relationship is what he was very much into, I think, at the time. And I don't know much about his biography, um, but, uh, he also had troubled relationship with his wife, um, I think, um, and um, I think he, and earlier on when he was writing Gubi Jinso, uh, Gubi Jinso is famous for his anti-feminist stance, and um, uh, he kind of, he doesn't really accept the feminist uh, position and uh, Fujio is the, the main character who wants to live independently but he says in, you know in his letter to his friend he wants to kill Fujio because you know he's he's had enough of, of, of this woman so I think he had much more straightforward idea of woman you know he, he, he was sometimes he's sometimes called a misogynist but I think something happened he's changed a lot towards the end of his life he was much more um, he had a much more complex notions of women. Um, he was much more accepting of women's voices. So you can, as you can see, you know, you, you hear more voices from Onobu um, than Tsuda. You know, she, you, you, he, he has much more sympathy towards female characters. And so I think the complex relationship that he wanted to portray, I think, comes from his interest in Jane Austen's novels, and and maybe he was much more empathetic towards Elizabeth and Emma, <laughs> you know, rather than just male characters. I don't know. Um, there are many many factors are you know can can be used to, to explain why he was interested in troubled relationship. But um, and actually, if you're interested in the in the Gubijin, so that that there was a a, a pretty famous uh, film made of that by oh. one of a very famous uh, director in, in Japanese film history, Kenji oh, Zibushi. Oh, I haven't watched that. Um, yeah. Yeah, Gubi Jinso, Jinso is, is a very interesting uh, novel. If you think about uh, women, uh, new women, you know, because there were many new women arising during Taisho period. And um, so I think Fujio represents the kind of women uh, who were uh, active at the time, um, people like Yosano Akiko, and I think I think he was very conscious of of portraying this new type of women. So, yes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kimio. That was a fantastic talk and a great Q and A. Mm. And we are so delighted that you're going to be joining us as co-host for our future events. And we'd also like to thank everyone in our audience. Um, please stick around. We have some pretty exciting news to share from Jane Austen and Company and the Jane Austen Summer Program, beginning with our lineup for our series, Asia and the Regency. So we have a full roster of events that's going to go through the first half of 2022 with a lot of really exciting talks. We're gonna hear more about modern translations of Pride and Prejudice in Japan. We're gonna hear about 19th century female Indian writers and Emma in Bollywood. We're gonna hear um, about tea and even from the author of Sansei and Sensibility. Next up, however, on December 2nd, we are talking global fashion in the age of Jane Austen. For those of you who have been with us from the beginning, you may recognize Hilary Davidson from our series before. She is the author of Dress in the Age of Jane Austen and one of the 
preeminent dress historians of this era. And then on the 16th, Peter Saber will be talking about Horace Walpole and China. Horace Walpole was an 18th century writer who is best known for founding the genre of Gothic novels that Catherine Moreland would love so much in Northanger Abbey. Well, he's gonna be talking about Walpole's fairy tales and their relationship to China. As with everything, you can register for free at janeaustinandco.org slash sign dash up. Um, and registration is completely free. Oh, Jared, you're, you're muted. You're Thank muted. You. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to read more about Jane Austen, her life, her afterlives, and adaptations, come check out the blog for the Jane Austen Summer Program or follow us <laughs> on social media. So Jane Austen Summer Program, JASP, as many of you know, is a four-day summer symposium that typically takes place in June in, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And 2022's theme is Austin and Shakespeare. And those specific dates are June 16th through 19th, 2022. So join us for lectures, hands-on workshops, small discussion groups, exhibits, and other activities that blend scholarship with, with fandom. Registration for that is not open yet, but it will be open in the next few weeks and it always sells out. So please keep an eye up for updates on that. And you can see everything about JASP at our website, janeaustinsummer.org. And I wanna thank all the many, many people who uh, came and visited from far and wide, including Scotland, Canada, Japan, Australia, to hear <laughs> Kimio talk. Uh, and for and to Kimio for taking the time to talk with us tonight. Um, this program was supported by the North Carolina Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment of the Humanities, www.nchumanities.org. Um, we would also like to thank UNC's Humanities for the Public Good, um, a project of the Col College of Arts and Sciences with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Carolina Asia Center. These three organizations have supported us in this program. And if you did enjoy tonight's programming, please consider making a donation to the Jane Austen Summer Program. We are a registered nonprofit, so your donations are tax deductible in the US. Donations help keep Jay and Co, Jane Austen and Co free and open to the public, and they help us bring in great speakers like Dr. Ogawa. And they also go to supporting our other activities, such as the student essay contests and annual teacher scholarships that enable middle and high school teachers to attend the summer program for free. Um, Giving Tuesday is November 30th worldwide. So um, contributions, think about, think about JASP um, and other Jane Austen related organizations um, on that day. Um, the, these kinds of gifts go far in showing how Jane Austen's work and world matter now, perhaps more than ever. Um, so thank you for considering where our organization, organization might fit with your giving. We hope you all remain happy and healthy and safe until we meet again. Um, so, and we will look forward to seeing you very, how, what, what's the day we're meeting again in? December 2nd, Eastern right. time. <laughs> all right. We look for those forward of to you abroad, that might be the third. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to seeing you all around December 2nd. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>